Welcome back. And in part two of this video, we'll pick up where we left off with proximity mode sensing. Proximity mode involves the detection of an object that is directly in front of the sensor by detecting the sensor's own emitted energy being reflected back to the object. So it uses the object that you're sensing as the reflective object and and so the, the light coming off of or out of the emitter reflects off of the object you're sensing and comes back to the receiver. So there are five proxying modes. Diffused, divergent, convergent, fixed field or background suppression, and adjustable field. In the diffuse sensing mode, this is the most common mode used in sensing. In this mode, the emitter and the receiver are in the same housing, and the emitter sends out light, so it emits light, and strikes the surface of the object that's being sensed. And it can, once the light strikes the object, it is reflected off at all kinds of arbitrary angles. The light is then diffused off. And as long as some of that light gets back into the receiver, this sensor will see that the object is present. This receiver uses lenses because what it has to do is the lenses on this sensor are going to have to collect this light that's coming back off of here. So that it'll use a lens on the front so that it will collect the diffused light coming back. This is the most popular type, like I mentioned. It's also the most affordable type. You'll see these all over the place on machines and in industry. The divergent mode of sensing, proxying, is a special short range mode that does not have a lens on the front of it. And it does not have a lens in an effort to avoid any signal loss if it's sensing shiny objects. So by not putting, and, and they call it a collimating lens, the sensing range gets shorter. So without that lens on the front, to get light coming back off of an object, the sensor has to get closer. And that way, I'm not really dependent upon the angle of the light coming back, and therefore I can sense some shiny objects with it. So it's another proxying mode, divergent meaning that it's no lens and have to get much closer to the object that you're sensing. The convergent beam sense mode. This is very effective when you need to sense small objects. They use lenses that focus the emitted light to an ex exact point in front of the sensor. And it also focus the receiver to this same point and it produces a small intense well-defined sense area at a fixed distance from the lens you can see that this particular sensor has a focal point which is right here so the light coming out of the receiver uh, out of the emitter is focused at this point this is also where the maximum amount of light will be returned to receiver. So when I have an object that I'm sensing at this point, I'll get the maximum amount of light back. The sensor also has a depth of field. And the depth of field means that as long as the object I'm sensing is within that depth, set depth of field, so anywhere in that range, the light coming off of the reflection of the object will still get back to the receiver. If I'm too close, the light will not re 
uh, reflect back into the receiver. If I'm too far away, the light will not get back to the receiver. So there's a depth of field that it can sense in, but here is the ideal point for sending back information. Then there's a fixed field background suppression type sensor. These have a definite limit to its sensing range. They will ignore objects beyond their sensing range regardless of the reflectivity of that object. Fixed field sensors compare the amount of reflected light seen by two differently aimed receivers and we'll call them R1 and R2. A target is recognized as long as the amount of light that reaches receiver number two, R2, is greater than or equal to the amount of light reaching receiver one or R2. So this should be actually R2 greater than or equal to R1. This is a depiction of a fixed field background suppression sensor. You have the emitter over here emitting light. They are lensed. You have R1 and R2, so there's two receivers. Light comes off and reflects off of this object, and we'll, this is called object A, which is actually this, the first position of the object. The light comes off, reflects, gets collected by the lens, and you can see here that it's striking R2. And remember, the sensor senses as long as the light being received by R2 is greater than or equal to the light that's received by R1. And right now, since it's striking R2, it is definitely greater than what's hitting R1. As this object moves in this direction, let's say the object was here. Now this light will get reflected off and might hit here. The light is now moving up. So the light is moving up along this surface of R2. It's still more light on R2 than there is on R1. Now the object is out here. The light coming back is right here. R2 is still receiving more light than R1. But now if this object moves out here, the light coming back off of this is now going to be striking R1. And now the light striking R1 is greater than the light striking than R2, and the receiver, said, the sensor will say, there's no object there. So when you look at the sensor, you have a fixed sensing field, so the, it'll see objects from this point to this point. It has a minimum sensing distance, so it has, the object has to be this far away from the lens before it can sense the object, and it has a maximum sensing distance. I never had a, a, a uh, application for one of these until I, I had a, uh, a student one time who worked at a company that they were packaging sheets of paper. Now, the, the, what they were trying to use this for failed because there were a lot of uh, variables that, that weren't taken into account. But these sensors are actually very, very accurate as far as the uh, position of the object. And what this company was trying to do was they had a sheet of corrugated cardboard on a conveyor belt. And this corrugated cardboard then would have sheets of paper on top of it. 
and let's say there were 30 sheets of paper. The sensor was mounted above it and it shined its light down on top and it would reflect off the paper back. You can adjust this sensor so that the distance that it's sensing, this fixed sensing field would be from here to here would be 30 sheets of paper. If I had 29 sheets of paper, I could sense it. If I had 31 sheets of paper, I could sense it. In the laboratory, it worked. But when it got into production, what they failed to understand is that the thickness of this corrugated cardboard varies. Also, they shrink wrapped it. And if anybody knows about shrink wrapping, and some of you that are already working in the field know that you can get wrinkles on the shrink wrap, you can sometimes press pressure down uh, harder on the corrugated cardboard or not as much pressure. Um, th it, this was a disaster in sensing when they got this into production. But I use this as an example to let you know that these are extremely sensitive sensors and can be accurate to one sheet of paper thickness. That's pretty accurate. There's then an adjustable field mode sensor. It's very, very similar to the fixed field sensor, except that this has a variable receiver. In other words, it has one long receiver, and it generates a current output. So that as the object is moving, or in this depth of field, as the light strikes and comes back at different spots along this receiver, depending on where it is in the field, I get a different current reading out here. And from this one, I can say, you know, if I get X current, the object is here. If I get Y current, the object might be here. So by reading the current value, I'll know exactly where the object is within the field. I have some of these in our lab, and later on in the course, uh, we, could, we can play with some of these. Most sensors have adjustments. Some of them have electrical and mechanical adjustments. Some of them just have mechanical adjustments, some of them just have electronic adjustments. So there's mechanical alignment, there's mechanical orientation with the targets. Some sensors have what's called a sensitivity adjustment to adjust the, and here's that word we used earlier, the gain of the sensor. This adjustment is made such that the sensor's output just turns on or off when the object to be sensed is within the sensing range. So that's an adjustment you make. You'll you'll put a uh, you'll put your you'll mount your sensor. You'll have your object that you want to sense, and you'll have it at the distance that it's going to sense, and then you'll adjust the sensitivity. And it's usually a a small screwdriver type potentiometer, so that at this distance, the sensor just either turns on or turns off, <clears throat> excuse me, depending on the mode that you have it operating in. Excessive gain is also a measurement that may be used to predict the reliability of a sensing system. It's a measurement of the sensing energy falling onto the receiving element and over and above the minimum amount required to just operate the sensor's amplifier. 
some sensors will have an adjustment or at least an indicator light to let you know that you have excessive gain. There's also several two modes of operation for a sensor. Some sensors can be changed from what's called light operated or to change it to dark operated. Light operated says that the sensor output will be energized or on when the receiver sees light. You gotta remember, sensors are switches. They turn on and off. It's a discrete device. So in light operated mode, the switch is closed, it's on. In dark operated mode, the switch is on when the sensor sees darkness or when the sensor does not see its own light. And again, some sensors can have this mode changed in some way. Some of them have a small adjustment. We have some in our lab that we'll, we'll uh, play with that have a round, what looks to be a potentiometer. You put a little screwdriver in there and it even feels like a potentiometer. However, one side rotating it one way is light operated, rotating it the other way is dark operated. And then other sensors are set to light or dark by a wiring configuration. And we'll talk all about that when we get there. Sensors also have a response time. And the response time of a sensor is the maximum amount of time required for the sensor to respond to a change in input signal or the sensing event. It's the time between the leading and trailing edge of a sensor event that changes that output. In other words, in, in simpler terms, if I've got something moving past a sensor at a rapid rate, can the sensor turn on and off fast enough to see that fast moving object? We've got a lot of high speed manufacturing in this country and in Europe and all over the world. Sensors need to see items that are moving past its, its, its light source at very high speeds. All of these specs are in the specification sheets and they'll sometimes make you calculate the response time, um, but usually it's, it's in the spec sheet as, as time. So why could response time be important? Well, you know, if the sensor's not turning on and off fast enough to see the ob every object that goes past its nose, you'll miss objects, you'll miss the product. So if, if I've got bottles that are going by the, the sensor head at a, a tremendous rate, and let's say I have 10 bottles that speed by the sensor head, maybe the sensor will not turn on and off 10 times, it might only turn on and off eight times. So I've only seen eight of them instead of the 10 of them. Um, I've got a, a video on the next slide that is from a, a bottling company or a company that, uh, excuse me, builds bottling machines. It's their name Crohn's AG. Uh, they have a high speed bottling, filling, labeling and packaging line that fills labels and packages 60,000.05 bottles of Pellegrino water per hour. 60,000 per hour. That's a thousand bottles per minute or 16.66 .66 bottles per second. That's fast. So drink up, let's enjoy and watch this video. By the way, in the YouTube, I'm sorry, in the uh, PDF version of these slides, you can use the, the URL link that is shown 
at the bottom of this video. The Italian classic among the mineral waters has long since moved beyond the confines of upmarket restaurants. More and more now, San Pellegrino is being consumed on the go in single-serve containers. The 0.5-litre PET bottle is booming. Reason enough for the Nestle-owned company San Pellegrino to install a high-speed PET bottling line from Crohn's. Rated at 60,000 0.5-litre bottles an hour, it started operation in February 2012. For this line, San Pellegrino opted once again for Crohn's as a single source vendor. The 60,000 BPH line starts with a Contiform monoblock, comprising a Contiform S30 with a Contifeed unit for the preforms, a preform interior cleaning feature and the PET view system for preform and container monitoring. The Contiform is directly synchronized with a model fill VFS volumetric filler in a monoblock configuration. The Checkmat 713 FMHF then monitors the fill level using a high frequency measurement. When they've been filled, the PET containers are passed through a container dryer, after which they arrive at the multi-module labeler, featuring two cold glue stations and a canmatic unit for hot melt wraparound labeling. The two cold glue stations apply firstly a neckband and secondly a medallion which is currently designed as a QR code for smartphones. The labelled containers are then passed to two end-of-the-line packers arranged in parallel, a VarioPack Pro FS for film-wrapped shrink packs and a VarioPack Pro PFS for pads and film shrink wrapping. The layer pattern is then created by a robo-box unit. A robo-grip 4A loading robot assembles the stacks on the pallets. after which these are transported to a block-type warehouse. The line is also equipped with a ZIP system, a Contiflow mixer and an LDS line documentation system from Crohn's. The installation of the entire line was completed on schedule. So there you saw some fairly high speed manufacturing and there's sensors all over that machine. So that's it for this video and um, we're going to be using some sensors in the lab. You're going to be learning about them. Um, there's hundreds and hundreds of different types of sensors so we're only going to be scratching the surface in our lab but you'll have enough information so that you will definitely be able to look at
pretty much any other any sensor and have a fairly good understanding of what's going on. See you later.